Championship Wrestling. Bringing you great wrestling action. Sanctioned by the NWA, National Wrestling Alliance. Let's do this, uh, this NWA show. I got a lot to say about this show. All right. NWA Championship Wrestling, June 7th, 1986. It opened with clips of uh, what appeared to be a house show where Dusty Rhodes might have been wrestling Barry Horowitz for a while when Ric Flair came out in full gear and robe to confront him. And we'll have more on this later. The announcers informed the world that Magnum TA had been stripped of the U.S. title due in part to his attack of uh, Nikita Koloff during their press conference and some other issues that arose afterwards. That's right. They, they talked about how he'd been stripped, and they said that it was supposed to be a one-hour match on the show tonight. But mm-hmm. Magnum had been stripped due to action unbecoming a champion. And yes. I was thinking, God, in the history of wrestling, how many of these press conferences have we seen, or these contract signings, that end up in a big brawl, and the podium gets tipped over, and two dudes get in a brawl? I thought, can you believe that in 1986, they did this angle, and a dude got stripped of the title for it? But then it turns out, there was more to the story. There is more to the story. <laughs> Which actually made it uh, a thousand times better. <laughs> Ron Garvin came out for a promo. And they also hyped the return of Ole Anderson. They, they, yeah, they, they, yes. And, uh, yeah. So Garvin comes out for a promo. He, uh, I'm not sure if he announced this had been signed or if he was issuing a challenge. But either way, he wanted a match with Tully Blanchard where both guys would have taped fists and they would do three-minute rounds. I thought about that for five seconds, and I thought, that sounds awesome. Hopefully that will happen on TV. The Rock and Roll Express faced Kent Glover and Bob Owens. Morton still had his Mankind face guard on, and the Express won with the double drop kick in a minute. Literally nothing to talk about here. I was going to say, I was going to assume this is not one of the matches that you have a lot to say about. No, but I will have a lot to say about the Rock and Roll Express before all is said and done. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I Jim posted Cornette. I posted on Twitter. I never really tell everybody what I'm talking about because I presume if you follow me, like, it's one thing to follow me on Twitter, but, like, if you, if you know and you listen to the shows and everything like that, then I shouldn't have to explain everything that I'm talking about. And all I had wrote was, oh, my God, these Rock and Roll Express contests. And, of course, I got some people that were, they immediately knew what I was talking about because there are a lot of people that follow along with this deal that we do every Sunday, but then there were the people that just had absolutely no idea what I was talking about, and I thought, you people are missing out by not watching these shows. Clearly. Let Clearly. me tell you. And what people thought was a good idea in 1986. Jim Cornette and Big Bubba came out for a promo. Cornette noted that ever since Big Bubba had shown up, the James Gang wasn't giving him any trouble anymore. He repeated his claim that no woman could beat a man in a wrestling match, not even a big woman like Baby Doll. <laughs> and he said she had the services of Dusty Rhodes, Magnum TA, the Rock and Roll Express, the Road Warriors, countless others. Then he asks what kind of services were being rendered. That's right. Cornette is such Scan- a great troll. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a very no scandalous woman work. can beat a man in a wrestling match, not even a woman as big as Baby Doll. That's right. That is right. Ric Flair came out for a promo. He was, of course, the heel wor- world champion, but he had a an entire section of fans in the studio tonight. A group of 20 or so young men all showed up in full suit and tie. That's right. Wearing, wearing uh, or carrying uh, his name spelled out in signs, you know, the R sign, the I sign, the, I sign, the C sign, so it said Ric Flair. Flair Slick acknowledged Rick is what it said. Slick Rick, that's right. That's right. I was very disappointed, actually, that I did not see Dave or Mike Tanay there with one of those signs. (laughs) Maybe next week. And the amount of money the local Kmart must have made when these guys came in to get suits. I suspect it was the first suit for a lot of these men. You know what's funny about it, too, is like, you see a lot of, of wrestling fans doing stuff like this, and they're your stereotypical wrestling fans, but these actually look like young handsome college dudes that were cool and they just decided that they liked rick flair and they were going to get suits and they were going to come and show their support yeah totally unlike what we see when actually i won't specify but i'm sure we'll see plenty anyone... of it here on this show i did not see anyone in a suit on the at the nxt show we went to no there was there was nothing there so he acknowledged these young men so there's 20 men like this in a studio in atlanta there was 20 million of them around the world 
He said, any woman would be proud to walk next to Ric Flair, arm in arm with Ric Flair, or even behind Ric Flair. And talked about how great the horsemen were. We got to talk about this he, woman they showed in the crowd when he talked about women who love Ric Flair. There was a very 1980s woman in the crowd. Oh my God, this woman's hair. Like, it literally defied physics. There, there's, yeah. there's no amount of Aquanet that could have made this work, but somehow it did. It was, it was uh, yeah, a, a new wave nightmare. It was, it was <laughs> feathered straight up in the air, and, yes. then, and then like shoulder length everywhere else. God. It was astounding. Uh, let's see, he promised Oli would, Oli would be back. Said today we would see Dusty Rhodes get beat up real bad. He plugged the Bass Tour, saying it was bigger than any football, basketball, or soccer game. He ran down every baby face in the world, showed off his Rolex, and he left. You know, I remember when we went to the convention, and uh, it's not even just the convention, but I mean, if we went to the, the NXT uh that NXT show that we went to, and you see all the young guys nowadays that have like the 1920s hairdos. You know the ones I'm talking about? Antonio uh, the Promise like... Thomas had it last year. A million guys have done it. You, you cut your hair, you comb it impeccably on a side part, and you just put some pomade and slick it back. This hair... I see, yes, yes. Yes, this hairstyle is, is back now. And, of course, in the 60s, dudes had long hair, and, you know, long hair is never going to go out of style. Hercules had long hair. There's always going to be long hair. People shave their heads, they don't shave their heads. Point I'm trying to make is every kind of hairdo appears to come back, but I honest to God don't think that these 80 hairdos are ever going to come back. We're never going to see the mullet again. We may actually you know what we might see a version of the mullet. But like these these hairdos that this woman had, these are not coming back in a style. And I will take that to the grave. I would be surprised just because they are a lot of work. Oh yeah, the the mullet may come back because it's just you get your hair cut and you're done. But uh, you just I don't, don't think cut part of gonna... it. Exactly, it's, it's, it's only half a haircut. Yes, uh, but th- this this Aquanet woman here probably hung herself upside down and then and then uh, hairsprayed her hair. The Jerry Curl will never return. <laughs> be, I wouldn't be sure about that one. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I've been wrong before, but I'm sure about this one. Rage and Bull versus Larry Clark. Bowl one with the flying burrito in a minute. You are not wasting time with the squashes this week. Let's talk about the important part of this match. In the middle of this match, David Crockett alerts us that later on in the show today, we are going to be introduced to Todd Champion. Mm -hmm. And he assured us, David Crockett assured us that we were going to like Todd Champion. (laughs) And I will leave it at that for right now. All right. So afterwards, Rage and Bull goes to cut a promo. He promises Paul Jones will be bald soon, and then thank God Boogie Woogie Man came out. Nothing against Rage and Bull, but Boogie Woogie Man is a better promo. He called Bull Willy Willy. He called Tony Shavanto. He mentioned Baron Von Roscoe. No, Rascal. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> I'm almost positive he said Baron Von Rascal. I got Roscoe. Either one's great, honestly. Well, what's, what's great about it is he vowed to beat Baron Von Rascal's brains out with his own black glove, which is a very, very serious threat, yet a very, very goofy insult. Yes. Well, I'm not sure how much of it is an insult, because he didn't... I don't think he meant to insult Tony by calling him Javanto. He may have he just, just not known what his name was. He just doesn't know the man's name. So he said Jones had cut his hair, the hair he had grown for 10 years. 10 years. <laughs> like, that's 10 years worth of growth. The lock of hair that they are displaying from Boogie Woogie Man's head is about 8 inches long. Sure. I don't think <laughs> I that's don't think 10 he... years. I'm sure he's been growing but... his hair out for 10 years, but he made it seem much more serious than it actually was. Yes. His beard, I would believe, has not been cut in 10 years. And then he had a Photoshop of Paul Jones bald. And there's this image on the screen. And I know fashions change and stuff, and things look different in 2016 than they did in 1986. But as soon as this image was on the screen, I thought, that is a huge improvement. You know, it was funny because I thought the exact same thing. Because well, he'd be doing- if you look at, like, Paul Jones's haircut that he had in 1986 fucking atrocious 
just the worst bowl cut, black dyed haircut you've ever seen in your whole life. Yeah. And they, they show up a, a picture of him with his head shaved. And I was like, God damn, like you look way better with your shaved head. But of course, yes. the insult was, my God, to, to be a to be a man and be bald. What could be a bigger insult than that? So the idea that they were going to take his horrific fucking hairdo and actually give him a better hairdo by shaving his head bald, that was far, far worse than actually just shaving his head bald. Yes. So we went back to the Dusty Rhodes Ric Flair encounter. It was the extended version of the house show footage they had shown earlier. And what a man. The funny funny thing was, uh, I don't know why, but when they showed the clip earlier, they... I, it wasn't a, it wasn't a house show, but it was more of a live show than the studio show. It had commentary as the point, but when they re-aired it, they redid commentary from the studio. Yeah, and uh, in fact, all the audio seemed to be redone. The it, the crowd noise seemed to be replaced by a generic white noise, and the uh, you, you could barely hear them hitting the mat of the ropes or anything. So it was quite strange. Uh, very appropriate on this uh, sad weekend to watch Dusty do the ollie shuffle and jabs. And he beat up Flair for about five or six minutes. And when Tully and Arn hit the ring for the DQ. And Dusty was fighting off these three men. But then Ole Anderson made his big return. That's right. And it was actually the first time on this show that the four horsemen had all been together on screen at the same time. That's right. So the four of them and JJ, they were quadruple, de- quadruple teaming him as Baby Doll ran for help. They laid it out with a gourd buster and were prepared to do something nefarious off the top rope when Magnum and the Rock and Rolls and Raisin Bull and Boogie Woogie and probably more people all hit the ring. So the horsemen bailed and they got to the floor and you've never seen a group of men so happy to beat up another man. Now before you they get were, to that, before you get to their, their celebration, which was fabulous, we got to talk about this match. This will come as a surprise to absolutely nobody who knows anything about Dusty Rose and Ric Flair. But this whole match was Dusty Rhodes beat the shit out of Ric Flair forever. Yes. Ric Flair couldn't do a thing. Everything he tried to do, Dusty countered. Dusty bounced him from pillar to post like a ping pong ball. He did his bionic elbow. He just made him look like a complete fool. And then, of course, all of the horsemen ran in, and that was the end of that. And in fact, after the horsemen ran in, it was one on three, Dusty yeah. Rhodes beating up two horsemen all by himself before Ole Anderson finally returned, and that was too much for Dusty Rhodes. But a three yes. on one, three on one, he could handle the four on three one. Three on one, including the world champion, the national champion, and the TV champion. That's right. That's right. Their, their, com- their combined might was no match for the American dream. Now, granted, when Ric Flair did these matches with anybody, I mean, he sold his ass off. I mean, he lost more matches than he won. Uh, obviously lots of DQs and that sort of thing, but he lost a lot of matches. He sold like a crazy man for everybody, but it was funny to watch this, him going in there and and literally getting nothing on Dusty Rhodes and his whole crew getting nothing on Dusty until the fourth guy showed up. Pestilence. (laughs) He may have been. (laughs) He may have been. Arn was definitely death. Yes. Because he's the one who beat you up the most. Anyway, so they beat up Dusty. All his friends come out. They clear the ring, and then even still at ringside, they're not just high-fiving. They're not slapping each other on the back. They are hugging, laughing, jumping up and down like they've just won the Super Bowl together. So they go from that shot, they go back to the studio in Atlanta, where R. Anderson is there now. He's cutting a promo live. He says the horsemen are reunited. They are four men back together as one. And now Dusty Rhodes is not safe. He's not safe in the ring. He's not safe in the parking lot. He's not safe in the bar. Then they go back to this other show where uh, the horse in the left ringside area, they've gone to the interview area, and they are cutting a promo about what they have done. Specifically, Ole Anderson's cutting a promo. And this was a great promo. Oh, my God. This promo was awesome. He was warning Dusty that he was... uh, on the other end of things now, or I forget exactly what he said, but he's he's back for revenge, essentially. And he said he was ne- not going to lay on the shelf. Thus he was a fool to think that was going to happen. And he, as he's talking, the other men are still just jubilant. This oh, is a yeah. great 
day to be a horseman. Ric Flair and Arn Anderson are howling with laughter in the background. They are so excited and so happy that the horsemen are back in business. They're giving each other high fives. They're celebrating. It was so... There's nothing better than when the heels get one up on the baby faces and they've got to let the whole world know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And Orly is saying, we're, if hey, you thought the Rock and Roll Express at us, we'll go through, through Ricky, we'll go through Robert, and then we'll get to the big man. We'll get to you, Dusty Rhodes. He's going off about how long they've been fighting and how all the terrible things they've done to each other and says, this won't be over until... And then he got bleeped. <laughs> he said something about, I don't even know what. I don't know what he threatened, but he it, came it back and said... It seemed to be something involving death, because he came back and he yes. was talking about coffins. Perhaps he said, this won't be over until I fucking kill you. <laughs> he may have said that. But uh, he said, we'll be the burial team, we'll be there with shovels, and one way or another we're going to take care of you once and for all. And he finished, and they all start to leave, and suddenly J.J. Dillon, who is always wearing a suit, always wearing glasses, looks like he'd be a good history teacher or something. He just starts randomly screaming. <laughs> he cannot contain his joy. This was so good. I gotta go watch this again. I gotta go then, watch this again. That was fabulous. That's right. And then when they're done, they go back to the studio. And Arn is so overjoyed. He has just seen the footage of this interview. He's still on cloud nine. And he is so happy that Dusty had claimed, Arn, you're next. And it turned out that Dusty was wrong. That's right. That's right. The, uh, Dusty and all the fans thought Arn was going to be next. And in fact, it was Dusty himself. Oh, this was Grant. Had a clip of uh, NWA President Bob Geigel with Magnum TA. This was amazing. Geigel reads a statement from the NWA Board of Directors. Now, you recall last week at the press conference between Magnum TA and Nikita Koloff, Nikita had insulted Magnum's mother. <laughs> and really all American women. And so Magnum had flown over the table to get a Nikita, and things went downhill from there. So first of all, this gimmick here with Geigel and Magnum, it was awesome because it was, it was a two-camera shoot, but it was multiple takes edited together. So you see Magnum with his hands at, like, chest level, and the camera would cut, and his hands would be down at his sides. Oh, yeah. All sorts of continuity errors. So Geigel uh, said there would be no fine, there would be no suspension. But Magnum TA, we are giving you an official reprimand for your actions during that press <laughs> We are now not gonna think. we are not gonna fine you, we're not gonna suspend you. We are just going to officially like it is on your record now. It is on your professional wrestling record that you have received a reprimand from the yes. NWA board of directors for we are going conduct to the world. unbecoming a champion. We are going to let the world know that we are wagging our finger at you. That's right. Bad Magnum. Bad champion. Now, you know what's amazing about this is he didn't get fined. He didn't get suspended. He didn't get stripped of the title. He only got a verbal reprimand. Yet because what he did was because of, and I quote, my mom, this is too much for Magnum. He was appalled they would disapprove of the way he had defended his mother. He said, the man insulted my mom. What was I supposed to do? This is my mom here, he said. That's a direct quote. This is my mom here. Yes. Well, Geigel is an authority figure. He does not take well to men questioning his authority. So he gets in Magnum's face. And if you've not seen Bob Geigel, and I'm guessing most people listening to him always haven't, he is a large man, but he's an older man. He's probably in his 60s. He's got glasses on. And he's in Magnum's face, but he's chastising this guy, saying, you are the United States champion. That means you have to be held to a higher standard. And Magnum's response to this higher standard was to punch Bob Geigel and then walk away. Now, let's, let's specify what happened here. He is being verbally reprimanded. And so he says, and I quote, well, reprimand this. And he proceeds to punch Bob Geigel in the neck. He doesn't punch him in the face. He doesn't punch him in the chest. He punches him right in the neck. And 60-something-year-old Bob Geigel goes down, and Magnum storms off. And it was funny because, like, I guess he was such a white meat babyface in 1996. The fact that this all had to do with his mother made him a babyface in this situation. But as a viewer looking at this in 2016, it was like, 
What a dumbass. Like, what, I wrote, a, what an idiot. That's exactly what I wrote. What an idiot. Is here, here's my words. Yeah, times change. Now he's it's, been stripped of the title. So yes. it's more than a verbal reprimand right now. You were so mad at Bob Geigel, who, quite frankly, all he's doing is delivering a message. This was voted yeah. upon by the NWA Board of Directors. This is what he said. A majority of them, not even all of them, and we don't even know how Bob Geigel voted, but a majority of them decided that this was conduct unbecoming a champion and Magnum deserved nothing more than a stern verbal reprimand. And this caused Magnum TA to punch Bob Geigel in the neck and then storm off. You know what? They were right. That's conduct unbecoming a champion, and I, I would totally vote agree. for him being stripped of that championship. I completely agree. Man. So this led to another Geigel segment where he announced that Magnum had been stripped of the U.S. championship for this unbecoming conduct. So from there, we go to commercial, and we come back. The Koloffs have now joined Tony Schiavone for a promo. They say, look at Magnum TA. He's going around attacking officials just to get out of this match with Nikita. And they had a point. And they were talking as if Magnum had been stripped of the U.S. title and had been awarded to Nikita. And Jim Crockett showed up to clarify. This is not true. He mentioned the board had voted this way. He did not say he had voted. That's right. He merely said, and, in, and the more I think about this, the more I realize what a brilliant plot device this is. Because this lets your babyface authority a figure enforce unpopular opinions, even if they disagree with them. Because they represent order, even if they disagree with the order. Anyway. He says, yes, we have stripped Magnum of the U.S. title, but that does not mean Nikita is U.S. champion. And then he announced there will be a best-of-seven series between Magnum and Nikita for the vacant championship. The first match will take place July 1st in Philadelphia. He leaves. Ivan is having none of this. He says, no, no, no. Nikita Koloff is the United States champion, but he will be good enough to give Magnum some title matches on this bash tour. <laughs> he calls out Dusty, and he calls out the Road Warriors, and he even calls out Ric Flair, who's going to be defending the title against Nikita during the bash. It is amazing. This Great American Bash is coming up, and it has totally revitalized this show. It really has, actually. Yeah, when they, when they announced that there was going to be a Great American Bash tour or whatever in 1986, and they start talking about all of these different cities that they're going to, and there's footage of this helicopter... And it's like, this is going to be the greatest promotional effort in the history of professional wrestling. The blah, 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 blah. And you're like, man, they're really going all out and making this seem like a big deal. But, I mean, come on now. And granted, I'm not going to say it was the biggest promotional effort in, in wrestling history. But, man, they did a hell of a job promoting this Great American Bash 86 tour. And it is a legendary tour. Oh, yeah. It's a big deal. And they uh, they, they made it clear it would not be the same card up and down every night after night. Flair will have different opponents in these 14 cities. He defends the world title every night. You're going to see personal rivalries. You're going to see grudge matches. You're going to see championship matches. And you're going to see new matches. That's right. Who wouldn't want to buy a ticket to this? And even though Ric Flair is a heel champion, and even though in many instances he is a coward, and he tries to find the easy way out, and he tries to get his friends to help him, Ric Flair is very excited that he's going to be defending the title 19 times during this tour, whatever number it is. That's right, because he, he, that means he's in the spotlight. That's right, he's in the spotlight and he's the man. That's where he deserves to be. He gets to prove it every night. Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson defeated George South and Randy Mulkey. The sentence was great. It goes about a minute. The horsemen hit the elevated gourd buster, and Arn makes the cover. And the Mulkeys are, of course, the Mulkeys. They are essentially booked and promoted as the worst wrestlers in the world. And George South, if you watch every week, he never, ever wins, but he always looks good. He's the competent member of this duo. So they hit Mulkey with a gourd buster. Arn makes the cover. George South enters the ring. He has a clear and obvious opportunity to break up this pin. But he stops. He kind of peers over to the side like he's examining Randy Mulkey. He apparently determines that Randy Mulkey has been killed. He turns around and he leaves the ring. I laughed so hard at that. <laughs> I was fixated on the fact that Arn Anderson pins Randy Mulkey. And on commentary, they announced that Arn is pretending that Randy Mulkey is Dusty Rhodes. And I thought, that is a fucking hell of an imagination right there. 
That's <laughs> very vivid, yes. Uh, they announced that Waylon Jennings and other country music stars will be performing at the bash shows. <laughs> Waylon Jennings. And then they interviewed him. In Waylon's studio, apparently. Tony Schiavone goes to, I'm guessing, Nashville. And he's interviewing Waylon Jennings. He had a new album to plug, of course. Oh, my God. It was, it was awesome. It was like it was MTV News. Tony Schiavone's sitting there. Yeah. And he's like, Waylon, tell me about this new album that you did in the studio. And Waylon... Oh, wait, wait. Before Waylon even gets into talking about professional wrestling, because, of course, that's why he's there. They're trying to get him to plug the Great American Bash Tour, and he's going to be performing or whatever. But Waylon Jennings, he's asked about his his new album, and so he's got to talk about it. He's talking about the production of it and the producer, and they're having so much good times together. And then he says, and you know something, Tony? I think I sound better than ever, because this, this is the first time I'm recording in digital. I was like, what the fuck? I'm old. This was the big breakthrough in 1986. He was recording yes. in digital and not analog. He's very excited about this new technology. And, of course, he was sure to mention it's my best album ever. Oh, yeah. Because that's what you do. God, have you ever read yeah. about Waylon, Waylon Jennings in, like, the uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, and then, of course, he ended up dying in, like, early 2000s? I know almost nothing about him. Well, all you need to know is that every single one of these wrestlers on the roster could have learned a thing or two from Waylon Jennings about the party life. Aha! Oh. Well, that's not surprising. So, they go on about the album. He apparently did a TV movie, I believe, with Dusty Rhodes. Talked about that experience for a while. Starts talking about how great wrestling fans are, and... It's gone too long. I'm wondering what the point of it all is. And then finally Tony says, Waylon, thank you for your time. And he turns to the camera and says, we'll be back with more exciting action or whatever. And as like the, the, the screen starts to fade to black, Waylon says, hey, you're a big guy. Do you wrestle at all? <laughs> and Tony's response, <laughs> Tony's response is, quote, not me, not at all. <laughs> Tony's as amazing. As if the entire, I don't know if the idea was just so ridiculous or beneath him. But he wanted to make it clear he did not wrestle, and under no circumstances would he wrestle. No, none. I laughed at that. Speaking of laughing, let's talk about Baby Doll's cowboy hat. Oh, my God, everything about this. I'm sure the rest of it was spectacular, too. But she comes out in the cowboy hat. It's a black cowboy hat. It's got various decorations around the, around the brim. It's got beads and probably feathers or whatever. And then dead center, right in front... There's a big, giant rattlesnake head, mouth open, fangs exposed. <laughs> Somebody thought that looked cool. Oh, yeah. Dusty, now, probably. Well, that's what I'm, actually that's a good point. Speaking of, Baby Doll was not here to cut a promo. Baby Doll was here to introduce a promo. So Savani says, here's Baby Doll. Baby Doll walks out in her rattlesnake head cowboy hat, and she says, here's a clip from Dusty. And they go to a pre-taped Dusty Rhodes promo. He's very low-key for most of this. He says, you know, the dream, the dream doesn't care if you're white or black or yellow, brown or green, but Ole Anderson, he's just a redneck. And I'm like, well, that's a, quite a cloud of cast over the guy of all the reasons you two hate each other. He says, this is pro wrestling, this is deadly serious, this is not a cartoon, this is not a comedy, comedy this is serious business. He's going off about how it's rough waters out there, and he's there to give fans shelter from the storm. And he kept talking, and it was uh, cryptic. It was vague. I believe he challenged Ole Anderson to a fight to the death, but I'm not sure. Yeah, he was playing it up like this was the final match for one or the other. I thought this was a goddamn great promo. I thought it was so... This was like a really... Dusty had some promos. He's got great delivery, and he's Dusty Rhodes, so... Sometimes he does a promo, and it's like, eh, it was a hell of a promo, but he really didn't say anything of any value whatsoever. He was just being dusty, and he's so good at it that he could read from the phone book, and it'd be awesome. This was a goddamn great promo. This was a promo where you listened to it, and you were like, man, is one of these guys going to retire? Is, is, is like, Are they seriously like getting out of the business, and they're going to do the blow-off match here or something like that? This was a real money, I thought this was a real money promo. Yeah, and Nikita Koloff versus the advertised Todd Champion. Let's talk about this Todd Champion guy. Todd Champion's real name is Todd Bradford. 
You got that? I heard you. Todd Bradford, yes. Todd Bradford. Now, this guy decided that he was going to get into wrestling, and he needed a name. And he came up with Todd Champion. Todd Champion. So we like him on this show, they had a man named Frank Loser. <laughs> this champion guy. I, I don't know if this was actual his, his actual in-ring wrestling debut, but this was the year he debuted, so he hadn't been around for long. And Nikita gave him a lot. He was obviously very green. Nikita killed him and everything like that. He looked fine. I don't know what the hell ever happened to Todd Champion. He had a, like a, he had a career, but it was not like a career of any real renown. No offense to the guy no. or anything like that, but it was well, weird. He gets in there. He gets in there, and, and, and uh, David Crockett had been piping him up earlier. And he gets in there, and of course, Nikita Koloff is the big, strong, scary killer. And he's in there with Todd Champion, and you look, and you're like, you know, Nikita's got bigger muscles, but this champion fella is taller and has a broader frame. He's the bigger man. And uh, Nikita gave him a lot, and they got to a test of strength and stuff, and for three or four minutes, they had a very even match, and then Nikita hit the sickle and won. You know, it was funny that everybody talks about the 1980s, and all Vince McMahon wanted was these big, juiced-up guys, and all he cared about was bodies and everything like that. And granted... In the NWA, they were far more open to different body types, as we're well aware of with Dusty Rhodes. But it is interesting that we have this guy here, Todd Champion, and while he was a jobber, I mean, it was very, very clear that because of how tall he was, and because he had a good look and a good physique, they were going to do with something with him down the road. They were, they were, it wasn't just some, it wasn't like they were saying, later on in the show, we're going to see the debut of Jim Dawson. They never did anything like that. But this Todd no. Champion guy, they put this guy over like this guy could be something because of the way he looked. Because it's yeah. wrestling. Yeah. And to be fair, he was not, he wasn't, you know, he was an athlete. He did play football. He, he had great potential. True. Sure. Um, I don't know what happened. Uh, wrestling is hard. Dylan and Blanchard came out for a promo. They reminded everyone Blanchard had knocked out Ronnie Garvin before. Promised he was going to do it again. They advised Dusty to keep plenty of friends close by to watch his back. And then just before, just before they leave, they said they knew Ronnie Garvin didn't like to talk about it. He didn't want anyone else talking about it. He thought, perhaps he thought that if no one talked about it, they would forget it happened. But that wasn't going to happen. Everyone would always know that Garvin said he quit. And they laughed and they left. <laughs> I love these guys. Oh, they're the best. Magnum comes out with the U.S. belt. I got to talk about this. So Magnum T.A., he is a very good, fiery baby face, and he usually cuts, like, decent to good promos. But he's never cut, like, a lot of promos that I think, God damn, that was a great, great promo. This right here was the best Magnum TA promo I have ever seen in my whole life. He has the belt. He is appalled at what the NWA have ruled against him. Cuts his promo on Nikita, says... You had all these chances, Nikita. You could never get it done, no matter what the stipulation. And finally, you had to stoop so low as to bury my mother. Tried and true white meat babyface. He goes, you can take this belt out of my hands, but you can never take this out of my heart. And he calls him a no-good commie Russian and storms off. I was in awe of this Magnum TA promo. This was a great promo. And his, his other great line said he, he could not believe they were stripping him of his title, but it didn't matter. He had no problem fighting the Russians seven times. That's what he had to do to get the belt back. God, he was great it. here. It's too bad because it's almost the end. <laughs> it really is. Well, yeah, actually, yeah. God, it's too bad. Barbarian and Shaska Watley versus Italian, Stallion, and Jim Dawson. Okay, now tell me this wasn't the greatest match you've seen all week. Okay, I watched the show earlier this afternoon, and about, I don't know, two hours ago, maybe just an hour ago, I got a text from you going crazy about Jim Dawson. And I thought, I don't remember Jim Dawson. I opened my notes. I did a search for Jim Dawson. I saw, I had nothing to say about Jim Dawson himself. So apparently whatever was amazing about Jim Dawson, I missed it. Have you gone back to watch this yet? I have not. Okay, let me explain this to you. Please enlighten me. First off, the highlight was Paul Jones doing his wild ranting promo. 
He's, that, that I noted. He's that continuing I noted. this gimmick of seemingly never quite knowing where he's supposed to be looking. He or looked, when he's supposed to be talking. Yes, he'll look at the camera because there's one right in his face, but he knows that there are other cameras around, and so he's always looking all over the place, never quite sure what's focused on him at any given time. Which, by the way, it sounds like, I think if you're not watching it, it sounds like that would be like incompetence. It actually makes him look just incredibly paranoid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's really very effective. So he vows that Jimmy Valiant is an idiot. He's going to end up a bald-headed geek. And he says, no matter where I go, I do not want to see that bald-headed picture of myself anymore. And Tony and David Crockett are howling in the booth. And by the way, about two minutes later, they just put it on the screen anyway, just because they're trolls. (laughs) Total assholes. Then we got this Jim Dawson. It's been a long time since I've got to really talk about one of these jobbers. Jim Dawson looked like a fan who was in good shape. He had a semblance of abs, but he's standing there on the apron, and he is absolutely terrified that maybe, perhaps his partner might tag him, and he might have to get in the ring with these monsters. So, of course, he does get tagged in, and you've got to watch this match again, Vinny, to see this fucking guy. He sells in the dramatic fashion that you would see from a fan who was in the ring for the very first time. You know how they, like, arch their back, and there's all these theatrics, and they flop around everywhere? So Barbarian clearly has no use for this guy. (laughs) And I did notice a lot of Shaska Watley in this match. He Well, no. He fucking knocks down Jim Dawson, and he does... This is going to sound weird to say because you really can't work a double foot stomp. I mean, you do jump in the air and you do land with both feet on the guy and it is all of your weight. And I mean, there are ways to make it seem less horrible than it is. But I mean, you're really jumping up in the air and stomping on a guy. Fucking Barbarian does what I can only describe as a shoot double foot stomp. He (laughs) jumped and stomped right on this guy's stomach and then just stood there on the guy. Then he brings him over to the middle of the ring, and he gives him, as God is my witness, the funniest fucking press slam I've ever seen in my whole life. Barbarian is so strong that it does not matter if you are going to go up for the Barbarian. You're going to go up. It's better if you go up for him, because I think if you go up for him, he's going to put you down gently. But if you don't go up for him, like Jim Dawson here... He is just going to lift you up, and he's going to press you over his head, and he's going to throw you towards your head to the mat. And it's up to you to not die. I shouldn't laugh at this because it was so careless, but I was in tears at the press slam that Barbarian gave this Jim Dawson guy here. And then Jones hit him with the riding crop, and the heels won, and all was well in the world. But you've got to watch this again to see the magic of Jim Dawson. What I got out of this match is... We watch uh, Lucha Underground these days, and there's a wrestler on there called The Mac. Is he like Shaska Watley's nephew or something? <laughs> like legit? Yeah, they must be related. <laughs> Vinny. They look the same, they move the same, they wrestle the same. Maybe he was just a big fan growing up. It could be. Everyone's got a hero growing up. Maybe The Mac's favorite wrestler was Shaska Watley. Hell, mine is half the time. <laughs> so... Shaska wins with the superplex and a splash, and then Jones hits the ring. He hits his, for a guy who was a pro wrestler for a long time, he hits a very awkward knee drop. He's attacking him with a writing crop, and out comes Raging Bull, uh, Jimmy Valiant, and Ronnie Garvin. They hit the ring, and they are able to hold poor Shaska down and cut off some of his hair. God, Valiant there with scissors in the middle of this angle. That's <laughs> just like, this is... Uh. Yeah. I hope those are like the, uh, you know, the scissors you give kindergartners that aren't really that sharp. Sure, yeah. I, I hope that's what they were with, with uh, in Jimmy Valiant's hands. Paul Jones, by the way, at the end of this is all the baby faces are in the ring and they're cutting off Shaska Watley's hair. Paul Jones is on the outside and he runs at them with his riding crop. He's on the outside of the ring and they're in the inside of the ring. And he runs towards the ring swinging his riding crop. But then Jimmy Valiant just kicks the ropes and Paul Jones runs for his life. Oh, yeah. He's the best. <laughs> He's great. Wahoo Medano could a short promo. He hyped up a strap match with Jimmy Garvin. And they showed Garvin and Steve Regal jumping Wahoo and whipping him. And this led to Wahoo McDaniel versus Lee Peak. I'd like to add, by the way, that Tony introduces him 
And he says, my guest at this time, or whatever they said back in those days, is Wahoo McDaniel. And I thought, wow, he got it right. He called him, yes. He called him Wahoo McDaniel. And so they do the interview, and they go to the ring, and Wahoo McDaniel is facing Lee Peak, and they go right to David Crockett, and he welcomes us to this match with Wahoo McDaniels. And I'm like, there you go. could someone have just smartened this guy up one time? <laughs> well, I think they did smarten him up one time, and then he forgot. Let me read so, my Wahoo. review of this here very quickly. All right. I think this sums it up best. It's very poetic, if I do say so myself. Chief kills him with death, beats the fuck out of him, backbreakers him into oblivion. The ref is then like, his leg is on the ropes, and the chief must have told him, the fucker's dead, count. And so he counted, and that was the end. I loved it. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty much what happened. He hit a backbreaker, which he never wins matches with, by the way, but he did today, and they were by the ropes. And the ref said, I can't count his legs on the ropes. And Wahoo looked at the ref and said, I don't care. <laughs> he and counted. the ref counted him out. <laughs> so Lee Peek lost, and then Wahoo taunted the Ric Flair fans in the front row. I want a Wahoo McDaniel Brock Lesnar match, and I want a Wahoo McDaniel Samoa Joe match. And I would be a that happy would, man. Actually, Wahoo versus Samoa Joe would be amazing. It would be unbelievable. That would rule. Cornette returned for another promo. It was short, but he did say that Baby Doll had been out there earlier dressed as a cowgirl, but she was more cow than girl. Oh, man. I, I will admit I laughed at that one. And then he goes, you won't believe how big Bubba is. <laughs> I was like, he's right there. I can see him. I know how big he is. The Midnight Express faced two geeks. Dude, that's right. exactly what I did. I didn't even go back to get their names. It doesn't matter. That's literally was, what I wrote was Midnight's. I usually go back, but this time I was like, it doesn't matter. But I'm then, pretty sure. Oh, good. I, I was going to say, I didn't think it mattered until I watched it. And then I learned that one of them was Vernon Deaton. And I know this because Jim Cornette said, look at Vernon. He's hopeless. Oh, yeah. The other he guy. Deaton a lot. The other guy, I have no idea who this guy was. But you can add him to the list of guys that couldn't go up for anything. He was pale as fuck. He had blonde or red hair and a horrible mustache, baby blue trunks, knee pads under his tights, and elbow pads on each elbow to make sure that his arms looked even skinnier. Is he the one who Bobby gave him a suplex? And it had to be a shoot suplex because the guy gave him nothing. <laughs> so, that might have been Deaton. I think, I think that was Deaton. Bobby hits the suplex, and it is, like I say, it's a shoot suplex. He had to throw this man over while well, his might. And so he throws it over, and he gets up on one knee, and he looks at him, and he looks over Dennis Condry, and he just shakes his head. <laughs> what the fuck are we in here with? Uh, he beat up Vernon Deaton for a long time. Uh, eventually, they won with a rocket launcher. And that's all I got out of it. Nothing more. And then we had the most amazing segment on this show for sure. On any show I may have ever seen in my whole life. Before you talk seen... about this, before you talk about this, let's just remind everybody that Ric Flair is feuding with Ricky Morton, who is one yes. half of the Rock and Roll Express. And yes. in feuding with him, every week Ric Flair comes out and he has a very, 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 very tiny bra. And he makes fun of Ricky Morton, and he says that all of your fans are little prepubescent girls in training bras. Training underwear, he training says. Training underwear, he says. That led us to this. So, yeah, I, I, when I say amazing, I have seen many segments better than this, and I have seen many segments worse. I don't know if I've ever seen a segment more amazing than this that aired on an innocent Saturday afternoon or Saturday morning show in 1986. Tony Schiavone's out there, and then Rock and Roll Express are standing next to him. And Tony breaks the news that following the Great American Bash Tour, there's going to be the Rock and Roll Express Summer Sizzler Tour. This will be their loop they do after the Bash. This will be happening in, in August, I believe. And he says, You know, the Rock and Roll Express are very popular with fans, young and old alike. <laughs> So we're going to be having some contests where oh. you, the fans, might win a chance to interact with Ricky and Robert. First of these contests seems fairly straightforward. 
It's a look-alike contest. Oh, that sounds fun. It's open to boys and girls between 8 and 13 years of age. You just dress up like the Rock and Roll Express, take your photo, and send it in. And actually, there were some very complicated rules. Oh, yeah, they were contest Nazis. It's like, oh, this, absolutely. this is a contest for 8 to 13-year-olds, a Rock and Roll Express look-alike contest, but they made it very clear a person cannot be a member of more than one entry. So yes. you and me cannot send in a picture, and then you and Jim send in a picture. That's cheating. We would all be disqualified. That's yes. right. And he, he says you have to send it to this address. It has to be in this kind of envelope. The photos have to be the size. All sorts of very specific info. He's going on and on and on. Now, the prize winners for that, I, I believe there would be like six winners or something, but the winners will get to go to Six Flags with the Rock and Roll Express. That's right. Six Flags Atlanta get to spend the day with Ricky and Robert running all over the place and going on rides. That's right. Which actually sounds like a hell of a lot of fun. Especially in 1986. You know, listen, I know that I'm old and everything like that, but I don't know if I'm that old. Was this a thing in 1986? Was it like Polaroid cameras that were 4x5? Is that why they specified 4x5? Because every dimension I've seen for a picture of that size is always 4x6. Uh, I, I don't remember. I know Polaroids were certainly not 4x5 or 4x6. They're smaller than that. I don't know what the uh, 4x5 deal was. I, don't, I, don't, I, I have no answer. answer. Okay, but so far, we're like two or three minutes into this, and the Rockwell Express have said nothing. And Tony Schiavone has introduced a tour and a contest. A little Fine. weird, but that's okay. It's a, not even not even weird. It's unusual, but it makes sense. And it gives them the opportunity to get lots of cute kid pictures. And even the ones that don't win, they can put them on TV and make people happy. This is, this is all fine and dandy. And then things go off the rails. <laughs> Immediately and drastically. Because the next contest, you see, is the Miss Rock and Roll Contest. Now, this contest, Brian, it's not open to the 8 to 13-year-olds. No, of course no, not. No, no. This is open to the girls. Not women, mind you. The girls, ages 14 to 17. Yes. This absolutely had to be a rib on them played by Flair. <laughs> no. Let me, let, me t let me talk a little bit more about this, because i got to tell you what I saw. And I believe everybody saw this, but maybe I'm imagining things. So they announced there's a Miss Rock and Roll Express contest open only to girls between the age of 14 and 17. And they add, don't forget the photograph. Yes. Make sure you send in those <laughs> photographs, girls age 14 to 17, for the Miss Rock and Roll Express contest. Now, of course... There is a contest for the youngsters, the Rock and Roll Express look-alike contest, age 8 to 13. And then for the 14 and 17-year-olds, there is this Miss Rock and Roll Express contest where they say, make sure you send in your photograph. And I'm thinking, man, that's pretty sketchy right there. And then I believe for a moment, they threw up on the screen a graphic for what was next, which was the Rock and Roll Express Dream Date Contest. Yes. And they put it up, and then they immediately took it down. So Yeah, the, either me, 20 was going too fast or too slow, but yes. Yes, so, so I see this final contest. I see the graphic, and then it goes away. So in my mind, we've moved on to the next contest. So then they announce six ladies will win, and the winners will go on tour with the Rock and Roll Express. And I was like, man, this Rock and Roll Express, they're looking for some hot dates here and then as tony continues to talk i realized that they threw up the graphic too early and in fact the winners who are going on tour with the rock and roll express the six ladies going on a tour with them are the 14 to 17 year old girls yeah uh i am pretty sure that is right uh, i'm positive I that is right because they, they would, uh, part of the prize winner was they would accompany the Rock and Roll Express to ringside. Yes. At the, the various shows on the Rock and Roll Summer Sizzler Tour. Now, yeah. I, I will add that they did say that these 14 to 17-year-old girls must bring their legal guardians. But, oh, 
my God. Yeah. And I then, listen. can't imagine. Go ahead. Well, this thing, literally what happened is they asked 14 to 17-year-old girls, please send us your prettiest photos, and we'll take the prettiest ones and fly them around the country with these professional wrestlers in the heart of the 1980s. Yeah, that's exactly what they did. With their legal guardians, however. Sure. Now, in a whole different kind of crazy, as crazy as that was, then they announced the Rock and Roll Express dream date for those 18 and over. This is all one segment, by the way. Oh, yeah, we're still, I mean, it's probably longer than how long we've been spending discussing it here. So, the dream date is, it is open to ladies. Ladies. Graphics date. Ladies. 18 years of age or older. And this required, to win this contest, entrants were required to send in a photo. Again, please, 18-year-old girls, please send us your photo. And even better, an essay. A five fucking hundred fucking word essay. (laughs) I want to be the Rock and Roll Express's dream date because blank. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? There were there were no selfies in the eighties. There was no uh, there, there there was no Snapchat. This is what you had to do if you were a young girl looking for attention. Wait for the wrestlers to announce a contest and then send them all the photos you could. So I need to. Little, I need, I'm gonna listen. I, I swear to God, I'm gonna get a hold of Jim Cornette. And I'm going to find out if these letters exist. Because I need Ooh. them. <laughs> good call. Good, good call. So the prize for this contest is you all go on your, well, I guess two of them. We'll get the dream date with the Rock and Express in New York City. Oh, man. What could be better than that? I can't imagine anything going wrong there. So this goes on. This is seriously like a five-minute segment because there's three different contests. And Tony has to read the rules for all three of them. And explain what's going on. And it takes a long time, and the whole time, the Rockwell Express is just standing there, <laughs> maybe smiling a little. They're just mannequins. Actually, and after- Robert is just kind of staring at the camera like a Wait. mannequin. Yes. And Ricky is just, like, grinning the whole time. Like, <laughs> I can't believe this is actually taking place. It was yes. a fucking rib, and they're doing it. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what it was. So... Tony finishes, like I say, it's been five minutes, and Tony says that those are the contests, and man, we're all excited for the Rock and Roll Express Summer Says the Tour. And he turns the mic to Ricky Morton, and Ricky Morton says, this is a quote, the tour's going to be hot, woo! (laughs) And he leaves, and Gibson leaves, and that's the end. (laughs) Oh, my. The show is all downhill from here. There was nothing that could follow this segment. Ron Garvin wrestled Bill Tabb. This is funny because the gimmick, the, the finish is going to be like Garvin will do like a duck a clothesline, turn around, hit a punch. So he ducks the clothesline and he turns around and Bill Tab has tripped and is now on the ground. So he just waits. He just has his fists cocked and waits five or six seconds as Tab gets to his feet and turns around and then Garvin punches him anyway. Rage and Bull promised there would be more haircuts. Valiant showed up with the wool, as he claimed. They had shorn from Pistol Pez Watley's noggin and said this is nothing, there's going to be more to come. The James Boys and Baby Doll came out for a promo. They ran down the Midnight Express. Legitimately, I didn't understand one word Magnum said here. (laughs) This was not as good as his earlier promo. No. And then we had Jimmy Garvin and Steve Regal versus Rocky King and Paul Garner. It was funny as I was was already like, after the Rock and Roll Express thing, I mean, I was just like spent. (laughs) <laughs> I was just done with this show. Yeah. And I was looking at the thing, and it's like, what the fuck are they going to do for 10 more minutes on this show? And the answer was Jimmy Garvin and Steve Regal versus Rocky King and Paul Garner. This went forever. And it was funny because Garvin's been doing a singles wrestler here for uh, however many months he's been in. Here he's back with his old partner, Steve Regal. And the announcers even noted this. Garvin was taking it easy. Steve, you do all the work. I'll tag in, do like two punches, and tag back out. Hey, it's so the best this because is, this Jimmy Garvin guy, great promo, that's it. Well, I'm watching Steve Regal, and he's okay. He's got a cool dropkick. But all I could think was, 
this team beat the Road Warriors? <laughs> well, you like, know. E- even as a work, I couldn't believe that's possible. I don't understand how that could happen. So he eventually pinned Garner with a Russian leg sweep. And then, I don't know if I can say Jimmy Garvin saved the show, but he ended on a high note for sure. They're over there by the announce desk. And Garvin pulls out a copy of USA Today. He says, Tony, I'm such a gentleman. I'm such a friendly guy. I, with my own money, took out a personal ad of the nation's largest mag- largest newspaper. He unfolds USA Today, and he claims to read an ad looking for work for an old, run-down Indian with brain damage from being dropped on his head and scars on his back from being whipped. And he's talking about how there's some miles left but plenty of use and what various skills there might be and what jobs might be fitting. And he finally fishes, finishes and he throws the newspaper into the air and he cackles at his own joke. Oh, I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. But it was awesome more. because he's laughing and Steve Regal is laughing and Precious is just laughing and rubbing his shoulders. Oh yeah, they're a great act. But then there's still TV time to fill. So Garvin, I guess, he grabs something, which I can only assume was the format for the show. And he just starts at the top and starts burying all the baby faces on the way down. He can't believe Magnum TA was whining about his mom and then whining about his championship. And his mom probably wouldn't be so proud if she knew that Magnum used to be a dancer in San Francisco. Couldn't believe how unfair it was that the great Russian team would have to beat this man four times. He's running down Dusty. He's running down the Rockwell Express. And finally, he says, I have to get a meeting with, with Ted Turner. Something must be done. He never even mentioned her by name. But he's talking about Baby Doll. And he says, I want that wildebeest banned from the station. <laughs> and finally, they ran out of time and the show ended. You know, I've talked about Jimmy Garvin before. Him and Precious got married before I was born. There's still a couple today. Oh, yeah. He vowed that he was going to get into wrestling. He was going to get out at 40. He was going to become a pilot. He did all that. He appears, I don't know, but it appears that he figured out very early on, you know what? I'm a fucking flamboyant character. I'm a great personality. And I'm going to go a hell of a lot farther on that than on my wrestling. So I'll focus mostly on that and not kill myself in the ring. And this brings me all to a moment earlier in the show where they're building up the strap match between Jimmy Garvin and... And the Indian, as he calls him, I like to call him the chief, building up this and they show the footage of Steve Regal and Jimmy Garvin attacking Wahoo. And they attack him and Jimmy Garvin gets a strap and he's strapping Wahoo. Jimmy Garvin is so gently strapping Wahoo McDaniel because he knows that when they feud at some point, Wahoo is going to get a hold of that strap, and he oh, yeah. is going to strap Jimmy Garvin. That's true. And he knew going in, I'm going to be so nice when I strap this guy, I'm barely going to lay a hand on him. And he didn't give a shit if it looked good or not. He was looking out for himself. Good for him. That's, that's right. Good for him. So that was that. Fine show. A fine An amazing show. show. An amazing show. It's so much better with the bash coming. All right, everybody. At the one and only NWA World Championship Wrestling. Your favorite and mine. Only an hour and three minutes this week. I wonder what was happening where they had to cut away so early. Uh, Maybe. I don't know if they had the NBA playoffs or not then. The the, the two main culprits are always the NBA playoffs and Atlanta Braves baseball. And both Mm -hmm. may well have been going on. Opening clip was Ric Flair. I guess this happened last week on the show we missed. Uh, he was about to wrestle a jobber when Road Warrior Hawk came out. Flair dared him to brawl, and so Hawk kicked his ass. And we'll pick up on this later. Jim Cornette and Big Bubba joined the announcers. Now, David Crockett was there this week. He's been absent fairly regularly lately. But he was well, there. He's doing a lot of business for the Great American Bash. I suppose so. But Jim Cornette comes out and announces, I am going to be a co-host for the entire show. Good. He should be on every show. First order of business in this show, which I believe was shown, I don't think it was necessarily live, but it was taped Saturday morning and shown that afternoon. And Cornette's uh, first order of business was to plug a match with him and the Midnight Express in Albuquerque, New Mexico, 
which means as soon as the show was done, they had to leave the airport immediately and get on a plane and go to that show. Dude, they had a jet. Yeah. Yes, they did. Which I'll talk about later. They actually had two jets. So we have the Midnight Express versus Sam Houston and George South. I enjoyed Cornette referring to Sam Houston as the human broomstick. <laughs> you know what's funny? After watching The Women of Honor, I apologize for every bad thing I ever said about Sam Houston. <laughs> He's a very good opening match babyface. He looked fucking great here. Yes. Now, granted, let's be fair. He was working with Bobby Eaton. That also helps. And, and if you would have taken Bobby Eaton and put him in any one of those women's matches, it would have been better. Yeah. Now, because I'm mentioning the women, everybody knows my pet peeve lately, which is these goddamn lockups. If every woman in this business stopped wrestling right now and took one month and they just put Bobby Eaton locking up on a loop mm. and they watched it over and over and over and over and over and over again until it seeped into their consciousness. And then they spent another month going to the training school and just locking up over and over and over and over and over and over again for a month. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, Buddy Wayne made me do. Yeah. Ever tell you that story? Uh, no, but I've, I, I believe it. I drove down to a bull ring in Oregon mm -hmm. for the first match I'd ever had with Buddy. And by the way, the point of all of this is if they did that, every women's match would be twice as good. They just fixed that lockup. Buddy had seen me do a match, and I absolutely sucked, but I could do flips. And so he thought, I could have a match with this fella, because I know what I'm doing, and I could guide him through a match, like Bobby Eaton. And so Buddy and I, I drove, of course, drove all the way down to like Southern Oregon, like a five-hour drive for this show in a legit bullring. And when we got there, we got out of the car, and Buddy said... I can't remember what he said. He said something like, let me see your tie-up. He didn't say lock-up. Because at first, I didn't know what he was talking about. But he goes, let me see your tie-up. And so when I figured it out, I went to lock up with him. At the moment we locked up, he stopped. <laughs> and he put his hands to his side. And he almost got in the car and told me to just drive him back home. He was so appalled. He didn't care if I could do a hundred flips. He didn't care what I could do in the ring. My lockup sucked. And so he didn't want to ever have a match with me ever. And so he made me lock up, 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 lock up for seemingly years. I still can't lock up like Bob Eaton, but I fucking didn't hop, skip, and jump into it. Gotta fix these lockups. So these were top level jobbers. And so. The Express were giving them everything. Even Coronet noted, Bobby Eaton's in a charitable mood today. They finally cut Houston off, and to pay to pay the Midnight Express back for letting him get his shine first, they hit a double shoulder tackle, he hit a full flip bump, and landed on his belly. For a shoulder tackle! They kept beating on him. I was starting to think this was going too long, and the next thing you know, George South gets a hot tag and makes a legit, honest-to-God comeback. They finally cut him off with a backbreaker, and they pinned him with a rocket launcher. Great squash. It was, it was a squash. Yeah, it, it, was a, a, it was a good match. It was a great match. So they go to the announcers. It's Tony Schiavone and Jim Cornette. And Tony says, you know, Jim, we get a lot of cards and letters from fans at this program. Cornette says, I don't care. <laughs> he whines. He cuts a promo on the fans. He cuts a promo on Baby Doll. Says she's a dead duck at the paper. <laughs> he says <laughs> very strong words. He reminded Baby Doll. Even if you can't see Bubba, Bubba can see you. Mm. Well, that's creepy. I went to break. They came back. They showed Dusty Rhodes breaking the wooden chair over Bubba's head, and Bubba totally no-selling it. Cornette warned Dusty he wouldn't like Bubba when he was angry. And they said, you know, Cornette, you got your own matches coming up at the bash with Baby Doll. We saw your workout video, which we may have to go back and watch, actually. Yeah. Now it's time for Baby Doll's workout video. <laughs> And boy, did they deliver. <laughs> Baby doll worked out. She definitely worked out. So it was the 80s. And so her preparation for this fight with Jim Cornette was all stretching in her aerobics attire. Mm -hmm. With a headband. And lifting weights. Now, what I was very impressed with here is that when she was lifting weights, she was working all of her various body parts. Hey, as a workout, this is great. She did squats. She did curls. She did overhead presses. She did 
all sorts of things, which is amazing to me because every time I go to the gym, I see the same girls there because I go the same time every day. All they ever do is glutes. Mm. Ever. Yeah. I've never seen one of them on a bench. I've never seen one of them doing pull-ups, lat pull-downs, anything. All they do is squat, and they do those kickbacks for their butt, and they do it over and over and over and over and over again every single day. When I was a kid, guys used to go to the gym, and they would not do legs. That was a joke. You skip leg day. You skip leg day. Or, hey, how about you use that squat rack for squats instead of curls? Uh Now we've swung the other way where the girls want to do nothing but ass. Nothing. Nothing. So what this video was, was every soccer mom at every gym in America for the past 30 years. She did presses and then curls with the same 10-pound dumbbells without putting them down. She made kissy faces for the camera. She squatted 135 pounds twice. (laughs) <laughs> with a heavy spot. With a heavy spot. She did 180-pound leg presses and then probably 50-pound military presses. She puts down the, uh, uh, I guess it's a barbell after that. And then she turns around and walks away for a good, like, 30 seconds, this baby doll walking away. And it's not even the sexy ass shot. This is the back of her head as she walks away. And then she turns, looks at the camera, smiles, and pumps her fist. <laughs> I promise you, this is the least athletic babyface hype video ever. But it was including great. Including perhaps the one for the battle between you and me, where we were trying to make me look unathletic. Oh, yeah. It wasn't hard. No. This was, this was something to see. We had the Russians versus Vernon Deaton, Rocky King, and Gene Ligon. Cornette here is, they're coming back from the baby doll video. Cornette says, I benched 200 pounds last week. 20 pounds, 10 times. That's right. Proud of himself. He was making jokes and bragging about how he's going to beat up baby doll and show her where a woman belongs. And there's a moment of silence. And David Crockett says, with all the gravity he can muster, baby doll is going to destroy you. <laughs> he's <laughs> such a mark. It's great. <laughs> so Crusher Khrushchev is back. The Russians, Nikita's got the red singlet for the Soviet Union. And uh, Ivan's got the red singlet. Crusher is back for the first time since his injury, and he got it. it, It's a mostly black singlet with red stripes here and there. It was even shiny. It looked exactly like Vader from uh, 10 years later if he lost 150 pounds. Even Cornette was noticing his uh, how great his new gear looked. And the Russians beat them up forever. Nikita won with a sickle. I got to talk about my favorite part of this match and every match that you do in this show. Obviously, nowadays, all these matches are more competitive, and so they'll isolate a man, they get the heat on the guy, he tries to make a tag, and they don't let him. Not these Russians. They beat the shit out of a fresh man, then they throw his ass in the corner so he tags in another fresh man, they beat the shit out of that guy, and they throw his ass into the corner so he tags in another guy. They want you to make the tag, Mm -hmm. because it's fresh meat. So Nikita went with a sickle, and the Russians put all three dudes in cobra clutches just for fun. Because they're awesome. Yes. The Warlord versus Mike Simani. They could not have found a better jobber. I think it's impossible. This guy looked like a cross between Richard Simmons and Bozo the Clown. He was so unbelievably hideous. And the Warlord is out there just jacked to the gills. Just destroyed this guy. It was it was a this was this was almost as beautiful but not quite as the Women of Honor matches. The warlord's out there, and he's the warlord. He's 6'4", whatever, way over 300 pounds and jacked up. No face paint, but he's got... uh, Let's see if I remember this right. He's got the mullet with the middle part dyed black and the sides dyed blonde. I think I got that right. And uh, I was just trying to find a picture that I put on Twitter many months ago. I can't find it now. Anyway, so uh, Samani is pale, skinny, no body, and he has the hairy. Great, his body is hairy. His head is not, but he's grown out what little hair he has. <laughs> he looked like Bozo the Clown. Yeah. So the the reason I've been wondering, uh, I think we missed Warlord's actual debut. Why, when Baby Doll is Dusty's, his personal, why is she out there with Warlord? And the answer is because she recruited Warlord to protect her from Big Bubba, so she could deal with Cornet by himself. I by herself. see. So Warlord grabbed Samani, power slammed him, and pinned him. 
Cornet buried him, was not impressed with his win over Mike Simani, and then they all stared each other down for a while. And they're staring each other down, and we had a to-the-back moment here in 1986, as the next thing you know, Waylon Jennings is on TV, telling us he's leaning forward to the Great American Bash, and then they showed a skydiver. Yeah. And that was that. I love the usage of Waylon Jennings to hype up this deal. He's straight out of the wrestler playbook, this Waylon Jennings. We had <laughs> the announcers brought in Jim Crockett, Jim Crockett to talk about the bash. Oh, my God. So out walks Jim Crockett. And from the eyes down, he is totally respectable. Middle-aged man, three-piece suit, jacket all neatly pressed, tie tied right. He looks fine. And then just on a whim, I guess. <laughs> on somebody, a whim? Somebody said, hey, Jim, wear this white pimp hat. <laughs> he's got like a white fedora with a red floral brim it was so ridiculous like this had to be the period where him and the horsemen were partying on the private jet from city to city because there's no other That's way he would have put this sense. fucking thing on his head yes he looked he looked so ridiculous in this hat we had oh he, oh he, oh yes. i forgot what this led to he sends us to a special Video interview where David Crockett is talking to Dusty and Magnum. Yes. I have this queued up. Are you ready? I believe I am prepared. I'm not sure I am. Here we go. Great American Bash. It's here. It's upon us. 14 cities. And the thing is, only here in America could we do something like this. It's a place where you're free to talk, speak, whether he likes it or I like it. You can do what you want right here. America is very special to me. I know how I feel. I'm Man, so goddamn excited for the bash after that. Know, it's the only country in the world that affords you the Here's luxury Magda. to choose your own profession. Take the God-given talents that you've got. The only country in the there, world. The best you can oh, yeah. Be. Take that chance. Go out on the greatest adventure in the world. And being a part of the Great American Bash, being able to wrestle in them, being able to watch all the other great competition. It couldn't happen in any other place but America. Now listen to Dusty. And this is America's team right here. Dusty Rhodes and Magnum TA. Dusty? I think America to me because through the years, Dusty Rhodes, the American dream is my children and seeing them run and play and going to school and being free. And that word free, sometimes we take for granted. And Jim Crock Promotions set out to have the great American bash. It is a statement of freedom and the greatest sport that we feel in the world is professional wrestling and the greatest promotion. And the great American bash is coming to your country. That is free. It's coming all over the country, 14 cities. And if I had to sum it up in one word or two or three words, we've been talking about it. Is he I drunk? Stop talking about it. And I want to express my freedom. I want to do it, Jack. I want to get on with it, David. Can someone, like, transcribe that for me <laughs> so that I can go back and try and figure out what in the fuck he was talking about? That was the worst Dusty promo I've ever heard. <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> He's drunk or hungover. Oh, man. So to recap... Only in a great free country like America can you have big pro wrestling shows. Yeah, the Great American Bash is coming to your country. They all talk about freedom for a while. That's it. I just played it. I guess that was <laughs> What it. more is there to say? Well, there is more, actually. Because then they threw it to Willie Nelson. Excuse with his me. own... Did you say Willie Nelson? The country music singer. Willie Nelson. Willie man. Nelson. They threw it to Willie Nelson... With his own graphic, by the way, in the WCW uh, font and, and graphics. And he begins to recite poetry or something. Maybe in a freestyle rap. I'm not sure. Willie Nelson appeared to be in a park. There were birds. And like somebody walked by and saw him. And so they grabbed a WCW camera as he was randomly spouting poetry. He didn't mention one thing about wrestling. He didn't mention one thing about the Great American Bash. He's just spouting a poem about America. And then they put this on television. This was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. It was bizarre. Everything about this was just strange. We had the Andersons versus Tony Zane and Rocky Cronodal. I've now... 
This is not the first time I've seen the Andersons. I have seen their matches like against the Rock and Roll Express and some others, but they had a great match on that other show where Ole cut the amazing promo. And they had a great match here. They beat the fuck out of these men. Ole hit a diving knee strike like Seth Rollins and then tapped him out with an arm bar. Complete ass kicking. When you say arm bar, mm-hmm. we're not talking about a straight arm bar. No, this is not the cross arm breaker that, for example, Alberto Del Rio uses. No, he did the arm bar where you give a guy an arm drag and then you wrap up their arm like you see in every single solitary match. Yes. But Ole broke his arm. Because they work his arm over so much, he can't take it anymore. He taps out. That's right. He taps out to a rest hold because the Andersons are great. Then we had a dream segment as Jim Cornette interviewed all the horsemen except Ric Flair. The Andersons, J.J. Dillon, Tully Blanchard. Dillon vows Dusty is going down, maybe at the bash, maybe before the bash starts. Talks about how everyone thought the Road Warriors were unstoppable, but the horsemen laid them out, then picked them up and slapped them just to make a point. Tully says it doesn't matter how many friends Dusty surrounds himself with, they're going to take everyone out. Ole repeats his claim that Dusty will retire by the end of the year. Whether it takes him, whether it takes Tully, whether it takes Arn, whether it takes any one of them, whether it takes all five of them, Dusty is going down. And Arn called out every single baby face in the roster, dare them to come take any of their titles. A belt or no belt, none of them would ever be worthy to be a horseman. And they all did a big team handshake and screamed they were ready for the bash. What an awesome group if any of, of you badass heels. ever wondered why the horsemen are in the Hall of Fame, if you've ever wondered why... Everyone tries to emulate them for legitimately 30 years now. This is why. That's they were right. the best. Period. Done. Shivani goes to interview Paul Ellering. They re-showed the footage of Hawk destroying Flair. And the payoff to all this was Tully and Arn came out to make the save. Hawk threw Flair onto, the, onto them. And then Ole and Animal... Let me talk about that before you move on. Right. Hawk presses Ric Flair over his head. And Tully and Arn rush in outside because they're getting ready to catch him as Hawk gives him a press slam over the top rope. Hawk doesn't throw Ric Flair at them. He holds him up in the air, he walks to the ropes, and he just lets go. And Flair is going straight fucking down to his death. And Tully and Arn, because they're horsemen inside the ring and out, they leap forward and they save Ric Flair's life. What in the hell was Hawk thinking here? Well... It's been confirmed by everyone involved that Hawk sometimes on these shows was on substances. Well, you know, maybe that might have been why. I can't confirm it tonight. But at least instance. aim. Yeah. So, it turned into the Road Warriors and Paul Ellering versus the Horsemen and, and Dylan in a five-on-three brawl. As you can guess, this eventually went badly for the Warriors. Ellering got laid out. They hit a spike pile driver or an animal on the floor. And then Arn hit Hawk with a gourd buster that I swear to you was scarier than Hawk press slamming Flair out of the ring. Oh my god, they lifted him up like it was a vertical suplex. Yeah. And I'm like, why is this so scary? You're going to give him a a group vertical suplex? It's just a move. Mm -hmm. And then they dropped him the other way straight down on his face. Yes. Oh my god. He started to teeter like he's going to go off to the side. And then Arn Arn almost lost it going down. So he almost landed on the top of his head. And then as promised, they did hold Hawk up so Flair could slap him. They left them laying, and the horsemen all looked around. They surveyed the carnage they had done, and they had a huge party. Did I mention they're the best? No, oh, they're the best. The absolute best villains ever. However, LOD does a promo afterwards, and they're pissed off. Oh, yes. And if you remember on Tuesday's show, Craig all of a sudden got very sad because he remembered what the Road Warriors used to be and what they were here in WWF in 1997. This fucking Hawk promo. I swear to God, I should have had the clip of this. This was the best promo I have ever heard Hawk cut in my whole entire life. He was so fucking mad, and he vowed to kill Ric Flair, take his title, beat his ass, and leave him for dead. And it was great. Yeah, it was tremendous. The Rock and Roll Express versus Thunderfoot and Golden Terror. Thunderfoot related to Thunder Kitty. I don't know. Could be. He actually got the heat. Briefly. I guess, technically. <laughs> because Ricky had to one. go between his legs to counter something and then kick him. They double teamed him forever. Went to break. Came back. Double teamed him some more. Had a double drop kick in one. Easy. Cornet introduced a Ric Flair promo clip. So I'm assuming 
wherever Flair was defending his title that day, it was impossible to do the title defense and this studio show. So they had him do a pre-tape. Now, it's one thing to cut a great promo. Even in a studio with just a couple of dozen fans, they're still, they're still cheering, they're still clapping, there's some energy in the room, there's something to feed off of. It took Ric Flair, put him in an empty studio, pointed a camera at him and said, go. I gave him the mic. Yeah. Didn't even have someone hold the mic for him. No. And he was great. What a shocker. Was, I know. And, and, and it was all classic Ric Flair cliches about walking the aisle and finding out why he's the champ. Says he's got 14 title defenses in 30 days on this bash tour. The 14 toughest men in the world. He named like eight of them. I'm assuming some of them got more than one shot. But apparently Dusty Rhodes, both Road Warriors, both Rock and Roll Express, Wahoo McDaniel was in there. I assume Ronnie Garvin, Nikita, and all of them are going to find out why he's the best. That was tremendous. Shaska Watley versus uh, Shaska Watley and Baron Von Raschke versus Dave Spencer and Lee Peak. Cornet just buried the jobbers. And He's, I will say, while I ranted and raved about the women's lockups in particular earlier in the show, Dave Spencer had a worse lockup than I think any of the women that I saw all day today and maybe ever. It was so fucking terrible. I don't know how he made television. There are a couple of guys that actually happened on the show, but the star will do like a snapmare and then go to drop an elbow. And the guy taking the snapmare, well, not quite sure what's going on. He'll like sit up and he'll, he'll sell. He'll grab his neck. So he's not showing up the star or anything, but he's out of position. And the stars will just drop that damn elbow anyway and let it <laughs> land where it may. So Baron Von Raschke hits a snapmare. Uh, Spencer sits up and grabs his head, and Baron says, oh, well, and drops the point of his elbow right in the back of Spencer's neck. <laughs> totally illegal in every way yes. in UFC in 2016. For a reason. Yeah. For a reason. God, that was brutal. So the real stars here were not in the ring. It was Paul Jones and Jim Cornette. Paul Jones shows himself up later. <laughs> we'll get to that. This was not even his finest moment. In this segment... Cornette is asking him about the uh, scandalous artwork they've been showing that shows what Paul Jones might look like with a bald head, which would be a shame, as Cornette notes, that someone could lose a head of hair as beautiful as Paul Jones. Jones exclaims that he's been trying to find out who produced this photo and keeps putting it in the air. He has contacted Washington. Yeah. Paul Jones. <laughs> General Paul Jones. Called Washington, D.C. and said, oh, this is the general, Paul Jones. Yes. My army and I demand to know who's putting this this shopped photo of myself with no hair on TBS on Saturday mornings. I wonder if we ever find out. I suspect no. I mean, it's got to be Jimmy Valiant, I would think. <laughs> so the match keeps going. And Jones and Cornette are just putting each other, putting each other over constantly and pushing. They're, they're each pushing the other's programs. And Val, uh, Cornette's going off about how. Great it's going to be when Paul Jones finally makes that dirty, hippie, uh, Jimmy Valiant, a bald-headed geek. And Jones almost grasps, gasps and says, Jimmy Coronet, after you make baby dolls scream with that sugar hold, let's shave her bald too. <laughs> I have not fully figured out Paul Jones. <laughs> All I know is... We need more over-the-top heel managers hanging out together and sucking up to each other constantly. Sure. Shaska pin peak with a superplex. That's all I got to say about that. Not much more to say. Corna interviewed the Russians. You know what I love about this? You got Ivan, who is legit a Canadian. And you've got Nikita, who's legit some dude from the South. And they both try so Minnesota. hard... Uh, Minnesota, close south, south of Canada. Yeah, they're in America. Point is, trying so hard to do these fake Russian accents. And then Crusher Khrushchev comes on screen, and he doesn't even bother trying. <laughs> He's just a white fellow with a normal accent. Yeah, American sympathizer. I guess. I is just, that the gimmick? That's the gimmick. I see. I suspect they tried him to ha they had him try a Russian accent, and it was so horrible, they said, forget it. Mm. You're just an American sympathizer who wishes he was Russian. I see. So he vows they'll get the six-man titles back. Ivan says he is sick of hearing about how Dusty Rhodes and Willie Nelson enjoy their freedoms, but there would be no freedoms inside that steel cage match. This led me to believe Ivan Koloff's going to wrestle Willie Nelson inside a steel cage. Dude, be cool. 
I bet they would have a great time. <laughs> They'd have a great time. Wouldn't have a great match. No. It's Nik- a good promo. Nikita standing there in his t-shirt that he clearly had made at a booth in the mall. He heists up his title match against Ric Flair on July 4th at Liberty Stadium in Memphis. Oh, man. I bet that show did huge business. I'll bet that had quite the atmosphere. I bet it did. Tully Blanchard versus Italian Stallion. Nothing to it, just a squash. We talked about how great Tully is, and Italian Stallion is the, 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 the top of the bottom of the food chain here. Rarely, if ever, will you see two men fuck up so much stuff in two minutes and cover it all so well. Wrong. We saw it again immediately after this match in this promo. <laughs> Fair enough. Except T- they covered it up better. Tell me one of those things shot suplex. Paul Jones is there with his crew. And he stands and Jim Cornette is interviewing them. And the very first thing that comes out of Paul Jones's mouth is, you smell like a fresh of breath air. Now, that is not me screwing up and being marble-mouthed. That's what he said. So then, I still can't figure out this Paul Jones gimmick. Is he supposed to be a complete numbskull, or is he just a complete numbskull? Because then, he starts doing his promo, and he's stumbling all over his words. And then, he calls him Pistol, but has to correct himself back to Shaska. He fucked up everything about his promo here. (laughs) And then just gave up, and was like, Shaska. Then Shaska was awesome. Shaska was amazing. He's got his tuxedo jacket on, his top hat tipped to the side, running in place, screaming with joy about all the hillbillies he can't wait to beat. He dares you to stick your nose in this business because he's going to put out his fist and put some black on you, he says. He goes on for a while, and he is great. Then the Baron, who this week was randomly wearing a monocle, Cuts a promo about the loaded glove match he's going to have. He is going to climb that pole. He is going to get that loaded glove. He's going to take out Jimmy Valiant, and that is all the people need to know. And the whole time, the barbarian is standing in the background, stoic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he didn't know what was going on. <laughs> he's probably as confused as we were. He's a barbarian. These men were just babbling. In his mind, they were probably brilliant. They can't speak English. <laughs> Ronnie Garvin and Wahoo McDaniel beat Paul Garner and Kent Glover with a knockout punch in a minute. Oh, man. First off, what a waste. The idea of the team of Wahoo McDaniel and Ronnie Garvin. The two toughest fuckers on the whole roster. Yeah. And then they just had a quick nothing match. I was very disappointed. And the show ended with Shivani interviewing Ragin' Bull. <laughs> it's funny, Ragin' Bull... I'm sitting here typing what a passionate promo the guy's cutting. And little did I know, here comes Jimmy Valiant. Bull gets a promo saying soon Paul Jones will be bald as a peach. I thought to myself, peaches aren't bald. And sure enough, he said uh, said, uh, Paul would be fuzzy when they were done. He's rambling on about hard-boiled eggs and Lord knows what else when Jimmy Valiant comes out to be completely insane. He was completely insane. He vowed they were going to strip Jones naked, then beat him, then shave him. Which puts a whole new angle on the stip they're Man, doing. Man, it's quite a stip right there, yeah. yeah. The show was tremendous. I am so excited for the Great American Bash, and it happened when I was 10. Yes. <laughs> That's crazy. 